Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. You may start. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today is I, I welcome you. I welcome you for a specialized, uh, you know, uh, webinar on uh, TCI and TIVA in pediatric Good patients. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. You may start. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think my echoing is a little bit. Hello? I think that it was somebody speaking, madam. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Uh, so, again, good afternoon. I think this is a Sunday afternoon, and uh, I think all of us, we had a very good lunch, but still, we are, you know, here to listen to a specialized topic on TCI and TIVA in pediatric patients. So actually, just talk about some team about TIVA in a pediatric patient. I think when we were residents, so TIVA we used to use like you know we had a compos and uh, that is Zizapam and uh, Petrothal. So we used to do for all short procedures. Then came you know Midazolam and uh, Propofol and Ketamine. So maximum times we used to use uh, you know midazolam and ketamine all for the pediatric patients. So that was our TIVA, you know, and then we used to give small small doses uh, without uh, uh, you know no, knowing how much to give and how how much you know what will happen. Uh, then we came, you know, we had some syringe pump because uh, previous before the syringe pump we never had any. Uh, devices you know how to so we used to put it in a 100 ml uh, chamber and we would run with a dial of flow and that was our you know pump okay so later on uh, i think we had been syringe pump then we were very, quite happy because it was a quite a calculative doses we could give to the pediatric patients and uh, then uh, the great dex came and now the you know revolution is there we know the drugs pharmacokinetics we know the drugs how to give specialized in a pediatric patients and we know their outcome and we know how to use them and this is absolutely a niche area in the pediatric area in pediatric and not only in pediatric anesthesia but overall so many indications are there so i think i will welcome all of you for uh, this specialized webinar by department of anesthesia uh, pediatric anesthesia vadia children's hospital uh, by IAPA, that is Indian Association of uh, uh, Pediatric Anesthesiologists, Maharashtra State Chapter, and AOTA, that is which is a recently former organization. And uh, I think uh, uh, if Dr. Indrani is there, I can call her or we shall pro proceed. Dr. Indrani is there. Uh, I think, uh, she, I don't think she has joined. So let us uh, hear from uh, the stalwarts who are there, you know, who's conducting this webinar today, Dr. Kalpana Shah from Mumbai, from Merigao Valievo. Then uh, Dr. Tushar from Vadodara. I think Dr. Tushar Shoksi all over India and the internationally is a famous person. And Dr. Shishir uh, uh, Subramanyam, uh, who is uh, head of the, uh, department at Sakra World Hospital and uh, who's been doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, TCI, TIVA in the pediatric patient. So let us hear from this, all these gurus. So I think uh, I will hand over to uh, Dr. Subramanyam to proceed further for this. We are eager to hear from all the all of you. Dr. Subramanyam. Thank you, you ma'am. Uh, I'm audible, ma'am. Um... Yes. मैम पहले ये बता दीजिए आपके गांव में क्या है स्पेशल आप हो डॉक्टर कल्पना है सब फाउंडिंग मेंबर सब बिग सोसाइटीज वंडरफुल टू हैव यू मैम वंडरफुल कुछ गांव में ऐसा नहीं है कुछ खाली मुंबई नाम है मुंबई इज अ क्वाइट अ ग्लैमरस यू नो थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू इन मोस्ट बॉलीवुड इज देयर इन मुंबई ओके 
Wonderful, ma'am. Uh, it's a great yeah. pleasure to invite you all. Uh, um, I'm really happy that uh, uh, even though our new society has been, I mean, it's been nearly only a few months since we are in existence. We, uh, we have established a good rapport with you all and we're able to do a joint meeting wherein which, you know, certain things we can make it have clarity and take it forward. So yes. to help this in the, uh, to achieve this agenda, we have uh, three stalwarts in our field. Um, First, I want to introduce Dr. Tushar Bhai Choksi. Uh, you know, he is one of those, uh, you just, apna naam kaafi hai, iska naam kaafi hai. Yes. <laughs> and uh, um, so, he, you know, he's one of those early adapters, with whatever field we have, whether it is TIVA, whether it is other fields, uh, AI, uh, whatever you feel, you know, he's one of those early adapters, picks up what is going to be important in the future. And he's picked up uh, TIVA quite a few years back. And uh, we have been together forming, you know, uh, workshops at a national level and quite a few uh, conferences. And Tushar Bhai Choksi, please welcome. Uh, and uh, you'll be the first speaker. And I will introduce the other two and then let, let the stage for you guys. Um, so following that, our uh, Amchi Mumbai girl, uh, Kalpana, who, she is such a great, great host. And uh, uh, and uh, we are hap happy to have her as a front face of our IOTA. So she not only does uh, TIVA for normal surgeries, but she also does it for cardiac anesthesia, which is again, you know, people think uh, TIVA is only for, uh, you know, uh, short cases or easy cases. So we have uh, her. And uh, to top it all, what we have is, is Dr. Shishu Chandrasekhar. So he has been using TIVA uh, since the time he was in London. So he has worked in Great Ormond Street, where he has used TIVA extensively in children. After coming back, all of us, you know, those who have trained in UK felt you know, we did lack that, you know, uh, push for TIVA. But now, in the last few years, we have seen the pumps coming in, and the last three, four years, uh, everywhere, uh, Doctor uh, Shishir has been going and, you know, showing how to do uh, TIVA safely in children. Uh, thank you all. Uh, please welcome. And the stage is all yours, and we are happy to learn from you all. Uh, it's true for everyone who is logged in today. Thank you. Uh... Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm Dr. Tushar Joksi. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kalpna, Dr. Savan Madam, Dr. Subramaniam. And it is my great pleasure to give my talk to this August audience with webinar presence. And uh, as my dream came true, that last uh, three months before we have formed the IOTA Society, which it was my first and last uh, dream of my life that okay, every time of them thinking that after doing Tiva since the last 25 years, okay, I should have, we should have rather than the association of Tiva TCI. So today I'm going to introduce about the Tiva and then TCI Tiva, how introduced uh, in our market and uh, how it looks. Can you see my second slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, today my topic is just uh, practical. I'm going to talk about practical approach and updates of the TIVA TCI. We have formed, you know, I'm urging all of you to become a member of our association of TCI TIVA anesthesiologists. Our websites are there. Our Google forms are there. And it will be a privilege for both of us, both of both of the party, the anesthesia association of all our all over India and for association members also. So I am going to ask you about two things. How many of you are giving TIVA and then TCI TIVA? What is your definition of TIVA? What is your experience of TIVA? And will you give TIVA and TCI TIVA in your practice? The questions answers are very simple. When you started your practice in residency, that day onwards you have started this giving TIVA in your practice. So TIVA before that, that was given by you, that was in single syringe TIVA, plus you were just giving for short GA, like uh, abscess drainage or something like, uh, putting pantothal or only propofol. So that is the simple form of the TIVA. So my lecture route uh, roadmap will be history, definition, types of TIVA, indication, advantage, disadvantage, TIVA drugs, TIVA combination, methods of giving TIVA, different groups of patient, TIVA checklist, surgical procedure, which we are doing under TIVA or TCI TIVA, TIVA updates and TIVA apps. See, we, we learned that okay, our, NSSI, our NSSI is invented 178 years before, but TIVA is even older than that. 
in 1656 opium was given into dog and since 1936 the fever has changed the world of this anesthesia where pentothal was introduced in the market and then after ketamine propofol remifentanil remimizolam dexamethasone ciprofloral came in the market subsequently and you wouldn't believe that a inhalation agent lastly invented in 1980 that was seoflurane then after that was not introduced by anybody in the world but if you go to the tcit or market of the drugs then every year we are producing new tcit or drug in our armamentarium so i think uh, the future 10 years or 50 years is for the tcit only and this is the iv anesthesia history timeline for the tiva drugs so what is the definition of tiva people have so many myths and con- misconceptions of what how the definition is so it's a simple it is a technique of general anesthesia which uses combination of drugs given exclusively by the intravenous route without the use of the inhalation agent thus you remember without the inhalation without the use of inhalation agent including nitrous oxide but here oxygen compressed air or helium are exception so before going to second slide i want to emphasize that gas anesthesia means inhalation anesthesia is not used and tva is used in induction maintenance of anesthesia in both the way not only for induction not only for maintenance both the way tva is becoming popular since last 4 years because of corona because gas gives rise to always side effect in the form of aerosol and droplets so tva became a popular and at that time i have decided that now tva should become a popular in our indian markets now types of tva tva is uh, types of tva or tca tva is with endotracheal tube without endotracheal tube with supraglottic airway without supraglottic airway with nasal airway with oral airway or without this any uh, oral or nasal gadgets so people are asking everywhere from all over part of the world that uh, tva is only given in the intravenous drugs but when you intubate then then it becomes a not tva drugs tva technique but it is not like that here i have told you about the definition here the gas anesthesia is not used so tva indication nowadays when i go to give the this lecture then i am just giving the this uh, uh, tva indications but now today i will say from my side with confidently that okay, now tci tva is used from neonates to geriatrics from any surgical patient for any state of the anesthesia is tci tva used so particularly it is used in almost all surgical procedure airway procedure patient is having post operative nausea vomiting risk day care surgery short procedure like nora situation trainee teaching neurosurgery and neuro neuroanesthesia is coming up with a very heavily in the tci tiva market malignant hyperthermia susceptible present remote location anticipated uh, anticipated intubation and extubation with difficulty and even patient choice is also for the indication so what are the advantage except for the slight prick in the arm the patient is unaware no mask over the face no sudden concentration of the vapor i don't like uh, inhalation anesthesia when i gone to my anesthesia sur- surgical spine surgery i have specifically told to my anesthetist that i will take only tva drugs and tci there no inhalation agents to be given and comfortably i was operated for 3 hours by my surgeon only under tci tva no risk of mh very low incidence less chances of emergence phenomena and over and above there is no smell of the volatile agent at all in the room and the patient is usually most grateful reduce the stress response to the patient even anesthetic patient wakes up like a natural sleep see it is my personal experience less pnv less operating room pollution in war situation ambulance transfer and unexpected conditions if you go to the middle of the sea middle of the sky even anywhere space situation where we are using tca tiva and this is better than even inhalation anesthesia tiva is used in almost tca tiva is used in almost all surgical specialties and all surgical uh, system of the or a system of the uh, our body but there are some disadvantage pain on injection when we give prick to the patient before taking the vein so they have to go some pain when we are taking the uh, by needle injection is rever- irreversible once you give the injection they are not reversible disposable may be costly but now since last 5 years i see that our tci pumps have reduced their cost to 
even 40% to 50%. Some of the uh, machine which were available at 4 lakhs rupees, now it came down to 1.5 lakh to 2.5 lakhs up till the, this range. Incidence of awareness is if not given properly. Undetected error, not having another apparatus to carry TIVA. Difficulty in knowing blood concentration. Risk of bacterial contamination, especially when we are using the bulbs. Here TCI, I want to tell you that TCI, TCI TIVA completes this complete anesthesia circle with hypnosis, sympatholysis, amnesia, hemodynamic stability, immobility, and neuromuscular blockade. So what else you required by another agent of inhalation? Which are the TIVA drugs? Majority of the drugs which we are using on OT, they are available outside OT and inside OT. And all drugs, all these drugs can be given to any subset of the population from pediatric to geriatrics. And these are the drug list which we I have gathered. In last 178 years, more than 65 drugs are invented. And here we are using 45 drugs. And if we uh, not uh, concluding that uh, local anesthetic and inhalation agent, then we have primarily advantage of using the 25 drugs in EWA TCI practice. Ideal TRIVA drug is rapid onset of action, rapid predictable recovery, potent and lipid soluble, even it is water soluble, stable in any solution, chemically compatible in other drugs. So most important, it can be mixed with other IV agent, like propofol can be mixed with other agent. Devoid of adverse side effect, does not promote bacterial growth, no peri perivascular sloughing and low cost. So these are the TIVA drugs which I have put here one slide. All the drugs which you are using, they are available in our OT, outside OT. And we have to use all the drugs by your choice. So these are the IV anesthetic drugs. I will not go in detail because see, all people are using propofol, ketamine, magnesium sulfate, even remifentanil, uh, other fentanyl, everything. But I will go for one or two drugs that propofol. Propofol is a prime drug in all TCI TIVA practices. Initially, it is given, given IV as a bolus dose is 2 to 2.5 milligram. Then in TIVA mixture, if you are giving TIVA mixture without TCI TIVA machine, then 1 milligram per kilogram in any mixture and infusion 6 milligram per kilogram. And in right side, there is a chart of when you are giving TIVA dose and TCI TIVA dose. I have created a fantastic uh, infographics and uh, have almost all 47 drugs. This is for propofol. Second drug we are using is a ketamine. Ketamine is a very popular drug in pediatric anesthesia practice of TIVA. Where, see, if you are uh, comfortable by not using TIVA TCI pump, then you can use propofol and ketamine combination or propofol or ketamine in single, uh, another uh, syringes independently. And so this combination now uh, replaced by the next mandatory. So, now people are using not propofol ketamine, that is ketofol, wow, dex ket. So I call it is a brahmastra in our anesthesia practice. The dose is around 1 to 1.5 milligram to per kilogram body weight. This is ketamine infographics. Dex mandatory. This is newly introduced since last 10 years. It is alpha 2 agonist. I will urge every anesthetist to use in pediatric anesthesia these drugs. Normal dose is 1 microgram per kilogram body weight. Those who are not using, I have created this uh, poem for this. Those who are afraid to use. Other drug is etomidate. This is etomidate uh, infographics. Now we are using fentanyl since so many years. Now recently introduced the ramifentanyl in our practice. And our first webinar from our association was on ramifentanyl, which was gained so popularity and we have crossed more than 10,000 viewers in our YouTube channel also. So it is available now in India, 1 milligram vial, 2 milligram vial. Initial dose is 1 microgram. TIVA maintenance is 0.25 to 0.5. And post-operative, we can use is 0.025 to 0.2 microgram. It is a very good combination in TCI TIVA practice with the propofol. Ramifentanil infographics. Newly entered drugs drug is ramimizolam, which was invented in Japan. And now I don't know okay, where it will be introduced in our Indian markets. Adjuvant drugs, midazolam. Midazolam I'm not using in my practice, but it is used since last 30 years very commonly. The dose is 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram in pediatric practice or even adult practice. Midazolam infographics. 
then magnesium sulfate. This is why my uh, very favorite drugs I'm using up till the even now in pediatric patient very judiciously. I do my pediatric practice in TCI Tiva uh, for at least 30 to 40 pra uh, percent practice of my uh, prior practices for the pediatric practice where I use in all major surgeries with magnesium sulfate. Available is a 2 milliml ampule with the 500 milligram per ml and total 1 milligram. So many companies are now producing this. The dose is 6 to 10 milligram per kilogram per hour. It is anti-hypertensive, bronchodilator, anti-arrhythmic, analgesic, anti-seizure, anti-severing. So it has got fantastic 32 clinical effects in uh, during anesthesia. Another drug is... So I call it is an intravenous oxygen. Another drug is dexamethasone. Dexamethasone can be given to any subset of the patient in any condition. I am routinely using in pediatric practice now. Another drug is lidocaine. It's a magic drug. And this for uh, uh, adjuvant, I use paracetamol even diclofenac for our TIVA practice. So these are infographics for esmolol also I am using in pediatric patient if it is more than two years old. Now come to TIVA drug combination. See what to understand before mixing any drugs for anesthesia. We have learned in our anesthesia the concept of the anesthesia triangle which, which works as a hypnosis, analgesia, relaxation and interaction by pharmacocytical, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics and thermodynamics uh, combination. So any drugs enter in this prism, they have to go by with the hypnosis, analgesia and relaxation. And the rule is that uh, you should not mix three drugs at a time. This is very good chart given in Columbian Journal of Anesthesia, which drugs can be mixed with which drug. Suppose propofol, which can be mixed, uh, mixed with which drug, like that. Like these are the combination. See, particularly I had given this slide, those who are not still using TCI TIVA in their practice. This webinar is for the TCI TIVA, but why I'm giving this? Because when I started with uh, my practice at that time, only infuse, uh, simple infusion pump were available and TCI pump was introduced just five years back in our market. So I have started this, this type of the combination, KPD, ketamine, propofol, dexmedetomidine, ketofol, ketodex or dexket. So ketofol, ketodex or ketomed, these are the three common combination we were using in our practice. You know by the name, ketofol means ketamine, propofol, ketodex or dexket means dex, dexmedetomidine and ketamine. Ketomed is ketamine and midazolam. Here the rule is that okay, you just remember one. Uh, figure one, one milligram dose or 0.1 milligram dose. KPD was, I was using since last 10 years in my practice and that is one, 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 one. That is ketamine propofol dex. Now I have less uh, using this because I have shifted myself to TCI TIVA practice. Propofol fentanyl combination, then RP TIVA, that is ramifentanyl propofol TIVA. This is very, very common and popularly used in TCI TIVA practice all over the world. Most widely TIVA and TCI combination. It will be told by the other two speakers. How to give TIVA? TIVA is given by single drug with combination or uh, single syringe technique or mixture of the drugs with only one drug. Continuous IV infusion with syringe infusion pump. These were the previous methods which we were using it. Now we are giving target control infusion with the pumps like propofol TCI or ramifentanyl TCI or ketamine TCI like that. Then lastly came the closed loop system. Single syringe, I told you okay, we have started our practice in single syringe technique. Then we were giving manual control infusion. Before TCI pump came, we were using Bristol regimen of the propofol manual infusion. That was uh, loading dose was 1 milligram as a bolus, then 10 milligram per kilogram per hour for 10 minutes, 8 milligram per kilogram hour for next 10 minutes, and then 6 milligram per kilogram per hour thereafter for up till 3-4 years of the infusion. Those people, those who are questioning about the dilution of the propofol, we can dilute the propofol, but dilution should be one part to four part. This is simple given in the uh, journals. Now total intravenous anesthesia sets are available. Now coming to the target control, the main thing of this lecture, uh, webinar is target control infusion, TCI. It is called target control and infusion. From the words only, you can uh, have this definition. 
A target control infusion is an infusion control to achieve the pre-shared drug in concentration in the plasma or the effect site. Dr. Kalpana is going to tell you about the detail of this TCI. Two types are models, specific drug model and general purpose model. And these are the marketly available models, Arcomed, then BDLRs, HP Medicaptan, B Brown. Nowadays, I came to know just 15 days before that more, more than 15 companies are selling their pump in Indian markets, including China, China and Japan. Single serine Tiva, double serine Tiva, three serine Tiva. And John Bayard Glenn, he was the father of modern Tiva, Tiva, Tiva technique. And I call him as a father of Tiva, TCI, who has introduced the prefuser pump in 1996 in first time in the world. So these are the advantage of this TCI pump, more predictable, more predictable offset and onset, and the short, uh, low incidence of UNV, short time to discharge. Patient control and sedation by TCI. Nowadays, new concept came that patient can control the uh, sedation post-operatively or during uh, their uh, procedure, even by himself, by target control infusion. And these are the pumps are available in the market. For pediatric patient, Two types of the pumps are available, Padfuser and Cataria, that is for Propofol, and Minto and this Alivel for the Ramifentanil. So these are the general purpose model, which will be told by the other people. I have developed my own infusion if I am, if anybody is not using this TCI pump. So it is also called as a TCI Tushar Choxy infusion, three styles. I usually give Capid infusion or Dexmedetermine infusion or Propofol infusion in my practice. These are the dose of these uh, infusions. 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, or in the Xmedin, 0 0.7 to 1 microgram, and Propofol 6 milligram per kilogram per hour. This is without TCI machine. Closed loop anesthesia is developing very nicely by Indian anesthesiologist, Dr. G.D. Puri. And this is the total complete uh, closed loop anesthesia system and closed loop anesthesia system models. So for this lecture, I say that pediatric TIVA or pediatric TCI TIVA is very commonly used now in all the part of the country and outside the country. Cataria and Pedfuser TCI models are available and we are using Propofol, Ketamine, Ramifentanil and Dexmedetermines, all the drugs in TIVA practice. And as far as I'm not telling that okay, you can't use TCI TIVA in neonates, but you can avoid TCI TIVA in neonates if you are not confident. So surgical procedure done under TIVA is from OT to outside OT, from pediatric to geriatric, from any surgical to medical specialty. Some checklists should be there in for all NSAT's mind that all NSAT drugs, survey equipment, oxygen, multi-para monitor is uh, giving before, must before giving TIVA, no leakage from the cannula, syringe should be labeled, infusion line should be checked every 50 minutes. You should have a lure lock connector of each end. If this is, I recommend that when you are going for TCI TIVA, you must use bispectral index or entropy in your practice. Start using today and you will be mastered in this TCI TIVA practice. And at the end of the case, ensure all tubing, IV cannula, which had TIVA drugs by any methods are plus to prevent inadvertent bolus in the ward. Some of the monitors we are using, Usually we are using multi-para monitor in our practice and with ETCO2 and so I told you okay, if you are comfortable or luxurious then you should use it by in, uh, index monitor but I consider myself as the best monitor of the NSSA practice. So all this monitor we can use in our practice. So TIVA and TCI TIVA has become a more popular practical and possible due to two main reasons. First is the advanced knowledge of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics property of the drugs such as propofol, ketamine, dexmedetomidine and newer sort of acting, acting uh, opioids like ultra sort acting that is ramifentanil making them suitable for the intravenous administration. Ramifentanil is a fantastic drug. Secondly, the new concept in pharmacokinetics modeling coupled with the advance in the technology of infusion pumps which allow the use of the algorithm such as series infusion pump, target control infusion and close loop. So I, this lecture is not for that okay, we are commonly uh, propagating the TCI TIVA, but it is a very good technique and we recommended okay, in each and every part of the world it should go. 
and TCA TIVA propofol remifentan is leading the world. Some of the TCA TIVA apps are there. ITIVA, IV calculator infusion. Now, Dr. Absalom, I consider it is a firstly in 1996, uh, Zod Bayan, I consider him as a father of TIVA. Now, this fellow, Dr. Absalom, our third webinar or fourth webinar will be this person is going to give this uh, our webinar on TCI TIVA banner, IOTA banner. But the only textbooks are available in the world for the TCI TIVA is this by Dr. Absalom. So TIVA, in fact, patient friendly, surgeon friendly, anesthesiologist friendly, economically friendly, environmentally friendly and productivity friendly. So TIVA and TCI will become a norm in future practice. And we are seeing after 10 years that okay, how it is going to uh, popularize in this coming years. Instead of this complex anesthesia machine with monitors, see, we are working with these type of the theaters, like we have wires, gadgets, monitors, infusion pumps, and ETC. So nowadays, uh, people are uh, introducing their in anesthesia machines, like future anesthesia works with switch on switch off anesthesia machine. See, TCI TIVA machine is one of the infusion pump is one of the part of this anesthesia workstation. There is only one button, a slip and a wake. When you want patient goes under anesthesia, put the uh, button on the a slip. And if you want to put patient on the outside uh, uh, in awake position, then you put on the awake uh, uh, mode. Newer drugs are coming in the market. That is Ramimizolam, so Sugamdex and other uh, drugs came in the market. But uh, this Ciprofol and other drugs will be coming in nearly within, it is introduced in China. So my take home message is total, in, total intravenous anesthesia is viable, safe, alternative to inhalation anesthesia. TCI pumps and advanced monitor make administration of TY easy and precise. And mental, manual control infusion using regular syringe pump can be used to deliver pre-calculated dose, those who are not using TCI machine. The newer intravenous hypnotics and analgesic agent with favorable pharmacokinetic property have made TIVA more popular in world wide era of the varying clinical scenario. So step in your comfort zone, coming out and use TCI TIVA for your safe anesthesia, safe surgery, safe patient, safe environment and safe. Your... Once you start your TCI TIVA practice, then you will forget about all the part that how you were practicing. Don't think, just start the practice of TCI TIVA. So today you learn which steps I want to see. This is just an introduction of the TIVA for 30 minutes. I have just given a glimpse of the TCI, TIVA and TIVA, how it is used. Now another, my two friends are going to get, uh, tell you the details of the TCI machines and how it should be started by the newer people of the NSSI practitioner. Thank you. Now I have, we have created a Facebook group of uh, association of TCI, TIVA anesthesiologists. Please join this association. And we have even a membership of this association so please log in to our uh, website and uh, fill the Google form and become a member of, you have so many privilege of this. We are usually going to give, uh, organizing a national conference in this year on India also. Thank you. Hello. Kalpana. Kalpana. I think she has to unmute. Yeah. Kalpana, unmute. Yeah. Yes, yes. Just a second. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Tushar, till that time, so it was really very nice informative lecture. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, I think in this recent time, everybody is uh, tempted to use this TCI TIVA. No, it was just uh, an TIVA introduction. You know, my lecture is more than one hour. So I have just given the glimpses of the TIVA. <laughs> no, we can have, you know, some other time. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. 
because Dr. so Kalpana, many analysts yes. want to use the TCI TY in their practice. Yes. Every day, yes, yes, yes. Five six machines are sold in all over India, and wow. uh, now all part of the country we are we are given the information that okay, we have started the TCI TY practice. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, Dr. Kalpana is ready. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Carry on, please. So good afternoon, seniors and my dear colleagues. I'm in gratitude to IAPA and Dr. Padna Savan for initiating us to give this talk on uh, TCI Tiva. Dr. Tushar has uh, made this, who's one of the founder members of our society, has made this a uh, really easy task for me by giving this uh, short introduction about and the glimpses of TCI Tiva and the, how he uses it. So now, before we embark on the journey to start off with Tiva TCI, we have to know a little bit of pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the drugs. So let's go through the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of Tiva TCI. So as we all know that uh, total intravenous anesthesia is uh, a technique where you are using a general anesthesia in combination with agents which are uh, solely used by intravenous route in absence of all uh, inhalational agents, which include even the uh, nitrous oxide. You have to give me a minute. There is one hitch that I'm having. I'm not able to, uh, some people are trying to join and I'm not able to join them. So just give me a minute. Can we have some questions to Dr. Tushar? So target control infusion is a computer control system which precisely regulates the drug delivery and maintains the desired depth of anesthesia by accurately modeling of the drug's pharmacokinetic and it will calculate the infusion rate to achieve a specific target concentration in the blood. <clears throat> we have to thank, as Dr. Tushar also just mentioned, Dr. Ian Glenn. What is not for him, this TCI would be a far-fetched dream. He gave us the best way. And he gave us how to use the propofol and made us understand the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of propofol. Now, the delivering anesthetic earlier through inhalational agents was easy because access was easy, delivery was easy, and you put in a one MAC and you know your target concentration. The equilibration would have been reached in the lung. But now what happens when we are putting in through an anesthetic to a vein? Now, here again, the access is not difficult. Intravenous line has been taken. You can start off your delivery with uh, propofol, but we were yet confused that what was the target concentration we are we wanted to reach. And this is the status quo we had in 1990. From there, we have made enormous progress in the same field and we have solved some problems and brought about some solutions. Again, access is very easy because you can take in an IV line, whereas the delivery now was guided through the TCI, uh, TCI artificial intelligence and some guidance system. And because we came to know the advanced pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drugs, we also had many responsive drugs, some of which, which Dr. Tushar also mentioned. And to top it all, we are now going to have propofol measurement done, entitled propofol measurement also coming up in a big way. So this is how Tiva TCI has moved ahead and hence we are here to give you a talk about the same. So the basic definition of a pharmacokinetic is nothing but a relationship between the dose and the plasma concentration. Pharmacodynamics is relationship between the plasma concentration and the effect. So we need to understand the absorption, distribution, and elimination of a drug to understand the pharmacokinetics. So as when we have, you know, like in a vaporizer, we have a certain uh, a, a MAC that we re reach. So we have got a target, con target concentration that we want to. What was happening is when we were giving IV manually, Either we were giving it as a continuous infusion, which you can see in the blue line, or we were giving intravenous boluses, which had numerous troughs and peaks, which were there. We were never able to reach a therapeutic range. So we wanted some mechanism through which we were reaching a good therapeutic range in our patients. However, there was something called as the Bristol Regimen, where we would manually infuse the propofol. And for manual infusion, Roberts et al. had brought about this thing that we can have a loading dose of one milligram per kg. Then for the next 10 minutes, 10 milligram, eight milligram per kg per hour for the next 10, and then that's six milligram. So this would kind of get us a target control infusion between 2.7 to three microgram per ml. And recovery after this procedure, which, was, which would last say around 90 minutes would be just in five to 10 minutes. So this is the another way where we could infuse 
uh, tea bath through manual infusion. But now with a target control infusion, it's as good as driving a Tesla car. It's really simple. You just set your target, titrate it up and down, sit back and relax. So to understand this, we need to understand three basic definition. One is the three compartment model. The next is understand the effect site and the plasma site and the context sensitive half time. So when we are introducing or bolusing any drug into the central compartment, and uh, so that is the V1 compartment, which is a compartment which gets full. After that, the, the, the drug gets moves into a rapidly equilibrating compartment, which is muscle rich with good vessel supply and slowly equilibrating compartment, which has a less of a blood supply like fat. And then it, of course, get eliminated and metabolized. Now, remember, the, it is the central compartment, the V1 compartment, which tells us what is going to be the effect site. Now, as these drugs move from these mathematical different compartments, we have a rate constant, which is called as K, which tells us how much, how fast the drug is moving between the intercompartments. Now, let us look at this with the help of, say, propofol. Now, if I were to understand the relationship between the plasma site and effect site concentration, here you have administered Tiva propofol, which results in a very high plasma concentration represented by the V1, which is the initial volume of distribution. This will then distribute into two smaller compartments, which is V2, which is muscle or vessel, which rapidly equilibrating compartment. And then you have a larger V3, which is a vessel poor, <clears throat> poorly equilibrating compartment. Now, as you all know, propofol binds with the lipid soluble and is, well, is lipid soluble and has high V3 volume of distribution. The volume of distribution in a steady state is nothing but the sum of V1, V2 and V3, which moves, the drug moves to and fro from the compartment is represented by the rate constant K. And the rate constant shows the distribution from the plasma to the brain, which is ultimately your site where you want it to act. The sizes of these compartments and the intercompartment clearance depends upon the properties of the drug and their tissue binding. And hence, this model for propofol will not be the same for other drugs. So hence, knowledge and distribution and redistribution, metabolism and clearance is important to be understood by an anesthesiologist. So this is a classical three compartment model of a propofol, as you can see. So the next is context sensitive half time. Now, when you, uh, what, what do you understand by a context sensitive half time? Basically, it's time to wake up. It is a time for plasma concentration to decrease by 50% after you have stopped the infusion. Now, context sensitive half time, a typical context sensitive half time, as you can see here in green line, is that of a propofol, is about 30 minutes for an infusion lasting for around two hours. It increases as the duration of infusion increases. Propofol being biphasic, it has an initial half-life being relatively quick, which is around, say, 30 to 40 minutes, and its terminal half-life being four to seven hours. So context sensitive half-life can even go up to one to three days if you're giving a propofol infusion in an ICU for a prolonged period of time, say, a week or so. So the clinical effect of propofol, however, is much shorter. In contrast to that, look at the black line, which is the remifentanil. Here, it is a rare exception because it is metabolized rapidly by the cholinesterase in the blood, of which it has got a very ubiquitous supply. So remifentanil has a very short context sensitivity half time, and hence the patient can wake up really faster out of remifentanil. Now, when you look at effect and plasma site concentration, so friends, when we are giving drugs, we used to always say microgram per kg or milligram per kg. Let us now move to effect site concentration for that particular patient for that particular type of surgery. So it's as good as instead of kilometers per hour, you set a time to reach your destination in hours. So when your syringe pump says CET or CPT, it says the target that you have set in either milligram per ml or nanogram per ml, that is a target you have set up in the plasma or as all the effect site. And the CE or the CP is a target that you have achieved. Now, again, to make you understand graphically, you can see the green line is the uh, effect site concentration and the, the uh, plasma concentration here, it will never overshoot above the set target. If you have set your plasma target to say, say three, it will be at three and a time will come when a steady state will be achieved between the plasma and the effect site. So it does have a slow onset and a slow offset. So the gray zone that you are seeing below down in the plasma site target, that is the time it has taken 
for the patient to have the effect site. So that is why it's a slow onset and a slow offset. This may be the area of awareness which you can make out if you are using some DOA monitors. Whereas in the effect site, the plasma concentration is going to overshoot to reach the effect site target. And hence you will get the high pharmacodynamic hit of the drug that you are using. Now this plasma concentration is going to overshoot so quickly. So it the aim is to achieve the effect site concentration very quickly. So it has got a quick onset and a quick offset. Again, to make you understand, as you can see here in the graph, the effect site concentration is lagging behind the plasma concentration because there is a blood brain barrier. And the TCI systems can now reduce this delay by raising this plasma concentration beyond the intended effect site concentration. And this then increases the gradient between the plasma and effect site, and it will help to pressurize the drug into the effect site more quickly. Most drug in the TCI models now do incorporate this. One more uh, thing that we must know is KEO, it is one of the rate constant. It is nothing but a liaison between the pharmacokinetic and the dynamic of a drug. So it is a rate constant which describes a time lag between the plasma concentration and the effect site concentration. So larger the KEO, the shorter is the time lag. Incorporating smaller KEO, then what will happen? You have to give larger bonuses to achieve the same effect site concentration. When compared in the same model, if a larger KEO is used. So remember, larger the KEO, shorter is the time lag. The patient, the effect site concentration is reached is much faster. So friends, a typical TCI system is going to consist of three main components. It has got a user interface incorporating a dis display and a method to input the data. It has a microprocessor to run the pharmacokinetic modeling software control. A third component, namely the infusion device, the visual and audible safety systems and alarms. All these infusion devices uh, should be able to give a high infusion rate, typically up to 1200 ml per hour, within a precision of 0.1 ml per hour. We have to thank Charles Minto, Thomas Schneider to get us all these models and all these TCI pumps which have now hit the market. And Professor mm -hmm. Michael Struz for the LEVEL model, which he has worked really hard on and is currently working on improving it more further. So as Dr. Uh, Dr. Tushar had also shown this slides, every drug has a different software model which you can use. Propofol being the most common mm -hmm. has got the LEVEL. You can use it with or without an opioid. You have Schneider, you have Marsh. The Remifentanil, which is now coming to the market, has got Minto model. The Ketamine has Domino and Dexmetomidine has the Dyke model available in most of our TVAR TCI pumps. So you can choose any of these. You'll have to just excuse me since I'm the host. I need to uh, admit a patients and I, uh, the students. And if I don't admit them, uh, I'm unable to talk at the same time. Sorry. So looking at the two models, that is the Marsh model and the Schneider model, as Dr. Tushar said, it is Marsh model was the one, the first one which was used in the diprifuser pump. It ignores the age. So when the age is ignored, V1, V3 will increase linearly with the weight. It only takes weight as the variable. So if you have a less robust patient, you have to better start with lower concentration and increase it gradually. They did modify this model. And as I explained to you, they increased the KEO. The KEO was first 0 0.26 and they increased the KEO to 1.2. So remember, larger the KEO, shorter is the time for the patient to reach the effect site quickly. Now in Schneider model, you have all the other pharmacokinetic parameters are there, which has been adjusted, the age, weight, gender, all has been used. So it is very good for using it for effect site targeting. And plasma site targeting can also be used, but it does give a very low concentration of the drug. So your induction is going to be really small, very, very slowly. They generally say marsh is harsh. So if you're going to use marsh in the plasma model, of course, it's going to give you a good pharmacodynamic hit, especially with propofol. So again, in mass, plasma concentration can be a modified marsh model. You can do an effect site also. As I said, only weight is used. Whereas in Schneider, the height, weight, and the age is used. Here, the compartment variables is bigger the V1 than the Schneider. The rate constant are all fixed. Whereas in Schneider model, the V1 is smaller and fixed V1 and V3 because you're using the age, height, and, and, and the weight of the patient. So the variable is going to be the vessel-rich compartment or the muscle-rich compartment, which is V2, which is something which is influenced by your age. Correct? 
and faster induction due to large v1 so therefore larger loading dose in marsh and hence we say marsh is harsh and in schneider overall less propofol is used and there are uh, decreased adverse events of the pharmacodynamic hit so again the same thing here again the variable parameters in marsh is v1 v2 v3 whereas in schneider it is uh, v2 the cataria model and the pet fuser model which are used in pediatrics of course use the parameters of weight and i'm going to leave this for dr shishir the following speaker who is uh, using it regularly in pediatric practice to enlighten you about the same <clears throat> now friends what happens if i have a patient who has a weight of 52 kilos the one of them have got a muscle mass which is less and one has a muscle mass which is more and the fat is more and the fat is less are you going to use the same model in this because again your v2 and v3 compartment is going to vary in this case so hence for this an elevel model or a general purpose model with an allometric scaling was brought about it was developed for a broad population range ranging from adults children older <clears throat> subjects and obese individuals it was constructed a three compartment model where weight age height pardon me i have not written the height weight age sex height uh, and even any opioids or any co medication that you are doing is that is also going to be taken into consideration and when they performed a retrospective analysis of this model performance it shows that the model performed at least as good or as better than the other dedicated popular models in our, all the populations that you have seen so right now uh, we have two or three syringe pumps which have come up with tci pumps which have come up with the elevel model and it has been a general purpose model which has been used <coughs> and also be used in pediatric patients so the next questions you are going to ask or i may have utterly confused you because you will ask me now which model should i use first of all don't be confused be familiar with one model start from a very low and then move on to a high target concentration especially in your elderly patients and sick individuals in obese patients because then you have a risk of overdosage you have to reduce your initial dosage in compromised patients especially patients with low ejection fraction and then the mantra is titrate 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 your way up and as you go about it you will get the hang of it remember this is an ai generated thing but you are the you are the brain behind that ai so uh, please use yours while you are doing it now you remember the nap 5 uh, protocol which was national audit protocol for accidental awareness now that does say that the depth of anesthesia monitoring is very imperative in patients uh, you know you can combine the eeg monitoring with surrogate measures of cerebral perfusion and oxygen supply such as near infrared spe spectroscopy which will facilitate a comprehensive assessment of patient's brain function and this can be established to aid the prognostication and possible post operative cognitive impairment if a patient does have so it is always better to guide your tva tci by monitoring depth of anesthesia again you have many monitors available to uh, guide your depth of anesthesia you have vis entropy narcotren patient state index cerebral state monitor you may use one which you are familiar with or which your hospital has but remember all of this basically looks at roy eeg data and a typical propofol anesthesia is going to look like this you have these alpha oscillations in blue which are and then you have interspersed with slow delta waves so they are piggybacking on the delta waves which are in green and then times when you have these burst suppressions where there is no activity at all you will see it in red so this is kind of the uh, uh, eeg pattern that you will see and uh, we we this whole is a big chapter on you know interpretation of eeg and the depth of anesthesia monitor which we can of course uh, hold up for you any other time that you require so the strategy when you are using different drug combinations you are going to ask me well you titrate down the drug with the slowest kinetic first the sequence will depend upon the local drug which you are available or your personal preference like say if you are using propofol then it is going to be slower than remifentanil and if you are using fentanyl it is going to be slower than propofol if you are using other adjuvants like dexmedetomidine and ketamine as you have been informed about then you it is better that you discontinue this before the end of the procedure at the end of the surgery you put your your target site to zero instead of powering off your tci pump so with this you will know what is you know the calculated effect site the decrement time and it will help you to judge how much time will the patient take to regain consciousness from your uh, target control infusion <clears throat> so friends tci is a no magic bullet but it is just a better way of dosing a drug 
And like every other system, you have to have your safety in place. So a safety checklist should be there where you see that the electricity is, uh, is uh, electricity is, uh, the pumps are all plugged in. Your pump that you're using does have a right drug, the right algorithm and the great patient and your whole patient or details are filled in properly. IV fluid is freely running. All your connecting lines are secured and there are no leaks. The cannula is secure without any kinks and see that your cannula is always visible. And most probably, if you can, avoid something in the anticubital fossa. Again, you have to avoid drug errors. So please label each of your syringes. See that you have one percentage all over your hospital. If you're using propofol, one <clears throat> percent everywhere in your hospital. Or if you're using remifentanil, one milligram or two milligram, which is now available. See that one type is used. So because if there are many anesthetists coming, you, do, you avoid drug errors. When you're infusing the, the program, in, uh, when you're uh, programming your infusion pump, you always have a two person check and always first insert the syringe and then only start your programming. Do not mix an opiate with a propofol. Flush all your lines after use and uh, so to um, twice the dead space that is there. And uh, these are the drug delivery system, which is commercially available. You have an anti reflux valve and anti siphon valves as well. So there is no backflow. And uh, here is a small video. Once you get a pump, how are you going to start it? So once you have loaded your syringe, you get your date and everything in your timing. You know your patient is an adult patient. So you have to feed in your patient data. What mode are you going to choose? Is it a TCI mode or a TVA mode? You have a TCI mode I have chosen here. Now you will, you have these arrows helping you go up and down. I'm using the Propofol 1% LEVEL model. So I've said it, yes. Now you're going to feed in all the data. That is A, in the LEVEL model, you feed in the age of the patient. Here he's 52 years old. The height of the patient, here it is 170 centimeter. You press OK and you will get it. The gender of the patient, whether the patient is a male or a female, the weight of the patient. And I think this patient's weighed around 52 kilos. So you uh, feed in with your navigation keys, go down and sorry, 62 kilos and put it that way. I, am I using an opioid? Yes, I'm using an opioid, right? So once you're fed in, your BMI comes, you again confirm everything that you have done, correct? You get your maximum target dose that is there. I will now choose whether I want to do plasma site or effect site and I use effect site most, mostly. And this is how your, you can start off your pump once you have fed in all the data after you put in your pharmac uh, pharmacokinetic model as well as the opioid in use. So friends, the take home message is uh, TCI is a result of more than 40 years of research. It is now a very common practice, mature and a very safe technology. It is not exotic as long as you have five rights of drug administration, the right drug, the right dose, the right route, the right time and the right patient. So if you try and fail, congratulations, most people won't even try. You may undergo different phases of TIVA usage. As you can see here, first you will find, oh, what, what the hell is this? You know, real, real weird thing. Why should I give up my inhalational agent? Then you see somebody using it or you attend a webinar and you feel, well, I think I should try it sometime. And when you try it once and it works, you are really amazed. And lo and behold, when your hospital gets your TCI pump, you are ecstatic. So this is the phases you will undergo when with your TVA, TIVA TCI usage. I can assure you all of that. So we need to find out who the winner is. Is it going to be the inhalational agent or is it going to be intravenous anesthesia? Good work is going on in both the things, uh, uh, in both the facilities. So let's see what who wins. And I thank you all for this patient sharing. Thank you once again. Excellent, Kalpana, excellent. So over to madam, seven minutes. Uh, Dr. Shishi's lecture is there, no? Dr. Shishir, yeah. Yes. Madam, am I audible and visible? Yes. Very much. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I consider it a particular honor to have been invited by Dr. Pradna Savant, whom I have listened to as a postgraduate, who's one of the doyens of pediatric anesthesia in the country. And uh, I am, uh, you know, uh, deeply grateful, madam, for uh, inviting me onto this uh, uh, platform today. Uh, so uh, I am a pediatric anesthetist uh, currently working as um, head of the Department of Anesthesia at Sakra World Hospital, Bangalore, uh, from where I bring uh, greetings to all of you listening. Uh, prior to that, I was a pediatric anesthetist at consultant at uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital, and I also trained there doing clinical and uh, research uh, fellowships. 
just a moment when I get to my next slide. Okay. Next slide is on. Yeah. Yeah, very much on. Very much okay, on. Okay. Right. So the topic assigned to me, an uh, interesting sounding topic, I think uh, Dr. Kalpana has uh, chosen the words uh, for me today, Tiva for ankle biters. So the little kids who keep snapping at our heels and keeps us uh, and keep us on our toes. So a lot of content you have already heard today from two excellent speakers, Dr. Tushar and Dr. Kalpana. And you might feel this is all very content heavy and difficult to kind of uh, understand uh, at one uh, point. Uh, so the, what I will try to do is try and keep my talk as uh, practical as possible and from a real world experience of uh, doing pediatric uh, TVAS. So if there are just three things that you can take away about today after this webinar from the three of us, First thing I would think of when you think about TCI Tiva, first thing is that Tiva and TCI has what has what it has done mainly, it has moved the conversation forward from dose to concentration and now to effect. So therein lies the evolution of anesthesia. So in a, in a simplistic way to look about look at it, the question now no longer remains what is the dose of propofol that you need to use? The answer is however much the patient needs. May not be a great answer for an examiner to hear, but that is the reality. And that is exactly what we're going to do with uh, TCI Tiva. So we have moved from dose to concentration and finally to effect. So that is the first take home point. The second take home point is just the word I want you to remember is BET, bolus elimination and transfer. So all you're trying to do is give a bolus initially, you're going to account for the elimination that happens from the drug, and you're going to also account for the transfers that happen from the V1, which Dr. Kalpana beautifully explained, to V2 and V3. So all you're trying to do is keep your concentration in V1 a constant. So that is the second concept of TCIT where I want you to want all of us to take away. And finally, and I think the most important, the way I think about uh, TCI is that you are essentially decoupling the airway from anesthesia delivery. So all you're now, that just opens up so many possibilities in so many situations. When your anesthetic is no longer, I mean, your airway is no longer the provider of anesthesia, your options of keeping a patient asleep and analgesed increases you know, it gives, it gives you so many more options and all you still, of course, need airway patency and airway security, but not airway for anesthesia delivery. So over the course of the next 25 minutes or so, what I hope to do is, uh, you know, try to address these questions because the TIVA is a huge chapter in itself. There's a whole textbook, as Dr. Tushar was saying, written about it. So everything can't be drummed into our heads within 20, 30 minutes. But I thought we look at key themes. By the end of this talk, I hope uh, we will be able to understand why we why TIVA is a reasonable option to use in kids how pediatric TIVA is different to how it's used in adults. This is essentially a Western European technique started in the UK and Sweden and all these countries. So how, uh, what are the real world advantages of even having uh, to follow TCI TIVA? Or is it just one of those things that's nice to know and nice to answer for a 10 mark or 20 mark question? I hope to convince you that it's not that and there are real world advantages. The other important question, and all anesthesiologists and particularly pediatric anesthesiologists will be worried of is when we try to change, we, we don't want to fix something that is not broken. So can this still be safely used in the Indian context? And uh, we do not want to put our kids at any risk at all. And that is something we will address, the safety concerns of TCI also. And finally, the new drug that everybody is talking about, Remifentanil. Why is everyone so excited about Remifentanil and what the big fuss about Remy is? We'll just go through these themes today. So first things first, how prevalent is pediatric TIVA use in India? The short answer is we don't know. But if the country's, one of the country's best center, centers of excellence in pediatrics is arranged a webinar for this. The answer is that if, if Varia is not using it, I'm very, very uh, sure not many others will be. So they are, it's very, very low, uh, uh, likely to be very, very low. Some adult TCIT has slowly kicked in, but it's still at its nascent uh, stages in India. 
Uh, we'll just look at some Western data about 14 years ago or so now, um, or, or 16 years ago, actually. Hortman et al. did a st study of this is of pediatric anesthetists in the UK. So for those who may not be aware in the UK, pediatric anesthetic services are quite highly centralized to about eight or 10 centers up and down the country. And he uh, and the team asked about 242 such anesthetists whose predominant role was doing pediatric anesthesia, how often they use TIVA. And one in four admitted to using it at least once a month. So the use was quite low. Fast forward that by about 10 years. So in 2019, when the same survey was repeated, one in two was using it at least once a month. And in fact, interestingly, almost 8%. So that's about one in 12 pediatric anesthetists in the UK were using TIVA as their default technique. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is a technique that I think Dr. Kalpana beautifully put up that last slide, that this is not something dangerous or cowboy-like that we are doing. This is a safe, time-tested uh, technique that has now just started making its way into pediatric practice, and it is being used safely up and down uh, the country, at least in the UK and in Western Europe. So uh, in terms of disclaimers, I do not have anything to, I have uh, advised a couple of companies when they have entered the Indian market, but I have taken no financial uh, interests whatsoever in, in them. Uh, my own practice, I use TCI propofol, uh, both more, my regimens of peed fuser and cataria, which we will talk about, mainly in ENT surgery, neurosurgery, the GI suite, and also in MRIs, where I have not had access to a TCI able, capable pump. I have used a manual steward regimen. This was in a two-year-old kid in whom we were doing a lipomeningomyelocele repair and where we wanted to preserve the bulbal cavernosis reflex. And after that, and that is a manual regime, uh, regimen that we have used. And I'll talk briefly about that as, the, uh, as we go on. So while I am definitely an advocate of uh, TCI, TIVA, and think that it's a great technique, I'm by no means evangelical about it. I would say about 30% of my practice might be TIVA, and the rest of it is conventional practice like all of you do. I hope for the day when we don't have to try to explain what the indications for TIVA are. TIVA is no different to any, or TCI is. TCI is no different to uh, any other anesthetic. So it's just another philosophy of anesthesia. But for the purposes of the postgraduates who might be listening to this, it's convenient. And this is a question that will get asked often. So for from the sake of convenience, you could just group it together into patient-related factors, surgical factors, and procedural factors. So where there is a known history or susceptibility to malignant hyperthermia, it's a no-brainer. You do not have any other choice. Volatiles are strictly contraindicated, so you will have to use uh, uh, TIVA anyway. Where there's uh, proven muscular dystrophy, where there's proven central core disease, there again, TCI comes into its own as the only viable option. Increasingly, softer indications are emerging where there is a known history, which again is very common in pediatrics, of postoperative nausea and vomiting, and where the kid has been known to be extremely delirious in the past following a sevoflurane anesthetic. That also serves as a patient-related indication for the use of TIVA. Where TIVA, like I was saying a bit earlier, the decoupling of the airway from anesthesia delivery means that it's an excellent option for shared airway work and for airway surgery. Because what we typically happens uh, with the airway surgery is that your patient has probably a MAC of one, and all the anesthetists at the top end probably have a MAC of 0.3 because of the you know uh, the gas uh, being everywhere in the vicinity of the child. So with TCI TIVA, naturally there's going to be no pollution of the operating room. You're going to get uh, the airway you know, airway access is much easier uh, for the surgeon, and your anesthesia delivery happens away from the airway. Again, intraoperative neuromonitoring in neurosurgery is, is another uh, very, very strong indication and emerging, emerging indication for the use of uh, TCI TIVA. Here, when the neurophysiologists look at um, SSEPs and MEPs, motor evoked potentials, those are all quite distorted by even as little as 0.6 of a MAC of sevoflurane. So if you want to be sure of the structural and functional integrity of the corticospinal tracts, TIVA an excellent option of being able to uh, get better quality signals of greater amplitude. Again, scoliosis surgery is another area, anything, anywhere where it's long protracted hours of surgery, uh, where the, uh, you know, the stimulus is also extremely high, that again, TIVA comes into its own. 
also procedural indications like if you're anest not everybody is lucky enough to have an anesthetic machine that is MRI compatible. I mean, in my hospital, luckily we do, but if I didn't, uh, you know, a pump with the, with the uh, obviously kept outside, uh, uh, you know, the danger zone, if you could uh, run a pump and run propofol through that, you could potentially keep a kid comfortably asleep and reliably asleep where you are getting kids for muscle biopsies, where you don't quite know what is going on it, and where it might be safe to, uh, it might be smarter to avoid volatile anesthetics, there again, TIVA comes into its own. So what are the real world benefits of uh, TCI TIVA? Again, a vast topic. So what I thought is we we'll focus on three or four of uh, practical things which are of relevance to anesthetists uh, up and down the country. So one of the big advantages is TIVA and TCI is very well known to greatly reduce the risk of post-operative vomiting. In kids, we don't call it PONV because the no subjective nausea component is often difficult to elicit. So, but post-operative vomiting definitely is down and we look at some of the literature whether that is the case. Great, much reduced incidence of emergence delirium is noticed in uh, with the use of TCI. Much great, lesser risk of laryngospasm, which again, as all pediatric anesthetists know, it is one of our dreaded complications and can have an incidence of as high as 5% in a standard population and even as high as one in four to one in five in those undergoing shared airway work. So there again, again, by TIVA, TCI here, I mean classical TCI TIVA, which is propofol and remifentanil. The reason I say that is remifentanil is a is an excellent cough suppressant and therein uh, and propofol also depressing the laryngeal reflexes beautifully together as a combination, they greatly reduce the risk of laryngospasm. And also finally, theater pollution. There is virtually no theater pollution with TCI TIVA compared to any volatile anesthetic that we would use. So Schaefer et al. Uh, published this study about seven years ago in pediatric anesthesia, looking at post-operative uh, uh, vomiting in kids. The incidence is beyond the age of three years. The incidence is twice as much as it is in adults. And depending on which study you look at, and this was pooled data, somewhere between 13 and 42% of kids will have post-operative vomiting. So these are huge numbers. And these are not just distressing, but can also cause problems with the surgical site and de delayed uh, discharges, as we all know. Volatiles are strongly associated, uh, especially sevoflurane. And uh, they came up with an interesting concept. So uh, all kids above the age of three, again, for the postgraduates listening, the recommendations is to give two anti-emetics. So in my practice, I give dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kg at the beginning of surgery. And towards the end of surgery, I give ondansetron 0.1 mg per kg. Under the age of three, one anti-emetic is enough. Over the age of three is when the risk of POE doubles. So that's when we use two anti-emetics. So what did they find when they used TCI TIVA? They say TCI TIVA is as effective as using a single anti-emetic. So the fact that it greatly reduces your risk of POE means that you could potentially just get away with using one anti-emetic. So that is how effective it is. Number needed to treat is again another concept which many of you may be aware of. So for uh, the number needed to treat in adults, so we do not have pediatric data for this, but in adults, it's as low as 5.5. So what that means is every 5.5 adults we do with TCI TIVA, one of them will not throw up at the end of the case, which is a big thing. So the lower the NNT, the better. So assuming, uh, uh, I, I mean, it's reasonable presumption to make that with PONV and POV rates being twice as much as adults, the NNT in kids will be most likely at least five or even lower. So that in itself is a strong indication for us to consider using TCI. Anybody who looks after kids knows that emergence delirium is a pestilent problem with kids. And uh, you know these kids are screaming the place down uh, for an hour sometimes in the recovery area. And you are nobody's friend when you have a screaming kid you are whom you're dumping on the recovery nurses. And again, very common with uh, sevoflurane. Many things have been tried uh, to, uh, you know, um, uh, many methods have been tried to prevent uh, this from happening. Some, I think even senior anesthetists still today use isoflurane in this context. Some may even still be using halothane, but CVO is our go-to inhalational anesthetic up and down the country now. So that's why just when we compare it with uh, CVO, uh, TCI TIVA has a much, much lower uh, uh, incidence of emergence delirium. 
and uh, Chandler et al. did a huge study about 10 years ago where they looked at emergence delirium in kids, did a randomized control trial of TCI. One arm was with propofol and remifentanil, the other arm with sevoflurane in kids who were undergoing strabismus surgery. And what they found was it more than halved the uh, ED risk. So the emergence delirium was only 15% or so in those who had had TCI versus almost 40% in those who didn't. So almost you know, a 200% improvement when you used TCI. And the number needed to treat is even more impressive than with POV. It was as low as four. So for every four kids that you anesthetize with TCI, one of them will not you know, wake up uh, screaming at the end of the case as a consequence of having used TCI, I mean. Finally, um, the other important thing is TCI and uh, TIVA and airway reactivity. This, in fact, is the most common indication among the UK pediatric anesthetists for their use of TIVA. Because TIVA is a great choice when there is a risk of increased risk of coughing, bronchospasm, and laryngospasm. And airway surgery ticks all these boxes, OK? Those kids who have had a recent URTI will potentially have, uh, you know, airway reactivity for increased airway reactivity for the next six to seven weeks. And these may be, again, very good kids in whom TCI with the excellent choice of propofol and remifentanil would be a good option. The other option with uh, airway reactivity, one of the big advantages is especially with the use of remifentanil, uh, using it at a slow dose and bringing it up gently is that it is easily titratable, easier than sometimes, at least for the novice anesthetist, easier than to titrate spontaneous ventilation with an uh, inhalational agent. And spontaneous ventilation can often be maintained comfortably uh, for long durations uh, of time also, should, they, should it be necessary. So if TCIT was such a brilliant option, why are we not all using it? So some of it, there are clearly there are barriers, there are limitations, uh, which have meant that we have not been able to use TCI and TIVA as much in the pediatric population all over the world, and particularly in India. So these are some of the th causes we can think of. One is still up, up till this point, unavailability of remifentanil in India was a problem. And this is, in fact, one of the reasons many of us who had trained in the UK and came back to India also were not really using TIVA much as a part of our practice because we were just unsure how to do the analgesic arm. And in my own case, I started using uh, TIVA about seven, six, seven years ago after uh, thinking that it's no, the analgesic arm is no different to what you would do if you were using an inhalational anesthetic. So I would give fentanyl and uh, morphine and uh, multimodal analgesia blocks where necessary. So all you're essentially doing with TCI, especially again for the PGs, is you're replacing your volatile. The rest of your anesthetic is not that different to what you're already doing. The other barrier, of course, was a lack of TCI pumps. That has definitely changed. Even as we speak, there are almost between 10 and 15 uh, manufacturers who are coming up with TCI pumps left and right. And these are actually softwares that can be added on to existing pumps. So if you already have existing pumps, it's worth talking to the guys, whether whichever company they may be from, whether they can add it on for an additional cost or even as a complimentary thing to uh, your machines. So all it is is a bit of software. There's nothing hardware that is different in these machines compared to uh, standard uh, syringe drivers. Other problems that we've, of course, had with kids and propofol is pain on injection. We look at what we can do to alleviate that. The big fear a lot of pediatric anesthetists and certainly pediatric intensivists have is about PRIS, the propofol infusion syndrome. But we will talk about how that has never been really seen in the operating room, but we will address that uh, fear also. And finally, I think NAP5, Dr. Kalpana alluded to the risk of awareness. And TIVA has earned a bit of a bad press, both in adults and in kids, that, oh, the risk of, because with uh, volatiles, we have something like MAC to look at. Not all of us have BIS, not all of us have entropy. So what are we, uh, how do we know this patient is asleep, whether adult or kid? So the risk of awareness is also something that has prompted some of us not to use TCI in our practice. So we'll address each of these uh, specifically. So how can we avoid pain on injection? The simple stuff, please tape the uh, IV tubing, hold the hand, reassure the kid, and you know, um, using propofol, MCT, and LCT, the, uh, it also is said to reduce the chances of uh, pain on injection. Mostly it is as uh, it's anxiety that the kid is uh, facing rather than pure pain. So having, in my own practice, for example, we ha always have the parent 
in the operating room with the kid as we are sending them off to sleep. And I have found that all the uh, problems that we had uh, we used to face uh, with a kicking, screaming kid goes away. And I can't remember the last time I've had to give any pre-medication of any sort to any child because the parent is the best pre-medicant. And uh, I mean, that's a topic uh, perhaps for another day, parental presence. But that is one thing we can do. Co-administering preservative-free lignocaine, about 0.2 to 0.5 uh, mg per kg. Uh, it's more for its local anesthetic effect rather than the systemic effect. So just squeezing the arm for a second, giving that to just blunt the, uh, you know, to, to, for its local anesthetic activity at the site of the cannula, and then starting the infusion is a good option, as is choosing as large a vein as we can find, because that will also definitely improve flow characteristics and should reduce pain. When we are using remifentanil, it's always a smart idea to start with remifentanil first, build it up, and then start the propofol because pretreatment with opioids also has been proven to decrease the pain on injection. Now, the big elephant in the room, as it were, propofol infusion syndrome. This is the reason why propofol has actually almost disappeared from pediatric ICUs. Because earlier, PICU sedation, those of who here, some of you here might have done PICU. Uh, certainly in the UK, it used to be that uh, propofol was used as a sedative, much like in adult ICU, but there were a series of case reports of propofol infusion syndrome. So now no PICU in the, in the West anywhere uses uh, propofol as a long-term uh, sedation on ICU. Now it's very much a morphine and midazolam uh, that is used. So the important things to know about PRIS is that firstly, it has never been reported from the operating room scenario. So where we have seen it is in the PICU setting where large doses of propofol of at least 6 mg per kg per hour were given for more than 48 hours in critically ill PICU kids. So which are very, very different patient cohort to what we would be anesthetizing for a, say an elective surgery, a kid coming, a healthy, otherwise healthy kid who comes there. But it's right for us to be a bit scared because when it happens, the, the it could be catastrophic. What it is, is essentially interference with the mitochondrial energy production system, the electron transport chain, leading very quickly to rhabdomyolysis, intractable acidosis, and rapidly developing multi-organ failure. So it is right for us to be worried, but the reassuring thing is that this has never been, it is not an OT-related uh, problem as such. And like I say, no reports in uh, theater environment. What can we do to reduce that? Using 2% propofol helps because typically propofol is available either as a 1% or as a 2%. I think there's only one company as of now, which is Baxter, which makes 2% propofol. And that's the propofol we use in our hospital for all patients, whether adults or kids. Because the logic with that is that you're halving the lipid load. The problem with Pris is in its lipid. It's not the propofol that was doing it, but the lecithins and the sphingomyelins and the, you know, the, and, and the lipids. Those were the culprits. So halving the lipid load helps. The other thing, of course, is those kids with MRFs and MELAs, so my, uh, my, mitochondrial myopathies, which are maternally inherited with, uh, with ragged red fibers and places like Wadia might be doing a lot of such kids, but the average hospital in the country was not very likely to see a kid with a MRF or a MELA. But in that situation, it's not smart to go ahead with uh, TIVA. Again, those with known lipid metabolism errors, it is prudent not to uh, do TCI. Awareness, the next big problem that uh, you know, has given TCI a bad name or a difficult press uh, recently. So 10 years ago, NAP5 uh, was a large study that was done over a period of a few weeks where they analyzed 2.8 million general anesthetics. And I think about 141 cases of awareness were noticed. So this is across all of the UK. And eight of these happened to be children. So what they noticed when they dug deeper is in the 141, 18% of the cases, so about one in five cases of awareness involved TCI. This may at the face of it look like a big number, but there are definitely, TCI is a very accepted technique in the UK. Those of who you have worked there will know that there, I would say something in the order of 25 to 30% anesthetists are using TCI at least as their default. And even in pediatrics, we just saw, saw that number where, you know, 8% are using it as their default technique. So it has to be taken in totality rather than just, uh, you know, looking and being spooked by that number. 
when they dug a bit deeper, what they found is this was not because uh, of the drug itself or the technique itself. It was the way the drug was be being given. So most commonly what uh, when they uh, looked at this is again both adults and kids when they looked at why awareness was happening, it was mainly due to fixed rate. Uh, infusions when these patients were either being shifted from ICU to OT or being uh, from OT to the scan and back to OT. This is the kind of uh, situation where awareness was described. But of course, TCI is not, and Dr. Kalpana has explained it beautifully, that it is not a fixed rate technique at all. It is a BET technique, which I said at the very beginning, bolus, elimination, and transfer. And that is precisely what we are trying to do. We are going to keep a fixed concentration in the V1 at, and uh, titrate our rates up and down to, uh, you know, allow for the elimination and for the transfer. So the moment you do that, your chances of um, uh, awareness definitely goes down. So please use TCI where available rather than fixed rate infusions. And the other big culprit and another pet peeve of mine is unnecessary use of relaxants by the clock. That is not something that is necessary for the vast majority of cases. So as long as we are using relaxants only when necessary, and uh, you know, uh, our big fear is of a paralyzed but aware patient. And that is going to only be a problem if we keep paralyzing them unnecessarily. So coming to the pharmacokinetics, which again, Dr. Kalpana has explained beautifully, there are some subtle differences that all of us need to be aware of between kids and adults. The V1 that she was alluding to is mm -hmm. twice as much as that in an adult, in a kid. So naturally the kids have a much higher perfusion of the core skeleton. So the, the it's a much larger uh, central compartment and consequently a larger volume of distribution into the V1, which is twice as much as that in an adult. So the way this mean what it means clinically is that they need 50% higher initial doses than an adult would and 25% higher initial infusion rates. So this is taking into account V1 and V2. So again, this is all inbuilt into the TCI regimens. So if you are using a pediatric friendly TCI regimen, it should not be a problem. So speaking of which, what regimens do we have? So the traditional models for pediatric uh, TCI have been Pedfuser and Katarian. Feed fuser is basically based on marsh pharmacokinetics. It is beyond the age of five years, you can use it. Five kilos, you can use it. Beyond the age of one year, you can use it. Kataria is slightly, uh, it came a bit later, slightly more refined uh, uh, model. Here, you can be, it can only be used in slightly older kids, three years and above, and 15 kilos and above. As for remifentanil, Minto regimen was the standard regimen till recently, and that could again only be used in kids above 30 kilos. So below that, there was no regimen till recently. Of course, that has changed now. The important thing to know with both Pedfuser and Kataria is that they, there was no effect site that had yet been described in children. Consequently, both of these regimens were plasma TCIs. So they took time for uh, to be able to send a kid off to sleep with, and it took us more time to wake the kid up at the end as well, because they were both plasma regimens rather than TCI. But that has changed. The A-level regim, uh, regimen, which the previous speakers also alluded to, has uh, kind of come and it looks very promising as a almost one size fits all kind of regimen, right from pediatrics to geriatrics, right from about two kilos to 120, 130 kilos. So the, again, different important thing to for the listeners is all the previous regimens that were discussed, Schneider and Marsh, they all were done with volunteer data from about 20 patients or 15 patients or so. But Elevel is a much, much bigger sample size of almost a thousand patients, almost 20,000 uh, uh, plasma, uh, uh, I think almost 30,000 plasma concentrations and 20,000 plus BIS values. So consequently, it's reasonable to assume that it is more representative of what is happening in real time in a larger and more diverse patient population than previously. So there are relevant regimens for propofol and remifentanil. And I think if we did the same talk in two years time, this is the regimen that everybody would be using as a default. There are other regimens available for Remy, including the Rigby Jones and the Kim models. We will not go into too much detail of each because that's kind of beyond the scope of a 30 minute, uh, 40 minute talk. So where possible, an effect site model is better. So the best way to think of difference between an effect site and plasma for pediatric anesthetic audience especially is like 
effect side is the equivalent of anesthetic overpressure. Now you want a MAC of one in a kid. What do we do? We dial up the CO to as high as 8%, which is essentially four MAC. So what it is doing is causing anesthetic overpressure. So we are able to get the kid off to sleep quicker. That practically speaking is exactly what happens in effect side. So if you set an effect side of about say three, your uh, uh, concentration goes up to about three to four times that and then starts falling down to hit three quickly. So it becomes clinically much smarter way of giving anesthesia and a practical way of giving anesthesia. So few points about propofol and its context sensitive half time. Again, context CSHT is the time it takes for the concentration in plasma to reduce by half after the termination of the infusion. It is longer in kids than it is in adults. So in an adult, say you ran propofol for an hour in six to seven minutes, it, CSHT, it would have come down to 50%, but it takes almost twice as long, 10.4 minutes in a kid. If you had run a four hour infusion, it will be about 10 minutes to come down in an adult and about 20 minutes. So there's no problem. The machine will understand that and compensate for that. But this is something as an end user, we need to be aware of. So what do I do if I do not have a pump? Like for everything in the, you know, these days there is an app. And I think Dr. Uh, Tushar showed you some of those ITVA and TIVA trainer, for example. This is what is called passive TIVA. So you can put on that app and, and it'll give you what ml an hour to infuse at. So your standard syringe drivers, you'll still be able to use it using that app in real time. Okay? Manual regimens also exist for propofol, which are very different to the Bristol regimen. So Dr. Kalpana briefly spoke about the Bristol regimen where it's one mg per kg bolus and then the 10, 8, 6 rule every 10 minutes. So it's 10 mg per kg per hour, then followed by for first 10 minutes, then 8 mg per kg per hour and then 6. This is in adults. But in kids, it's something called the McFarlane regimen, which is again targeting three mics per ml. So it's the bolus, as you can see, is two and a half mg per kg. So more than twice what it is in an adult, which again shouldn't be a surprise because we just said earlier that the central compartment is twice as much, twice as big. The V1 is twice as much in a kid as it is in an adult. So it's 2.5 bolus followed by the 15, 13, 11, and 10. So it's again something that we need to be aware of if you're using a manual regimen. Even smaller kids, and this is the regimen we have used, is something called the Stewart regimen. So in the Stewart regimen, you don't give a bolus, but you start with an infusion, and it is quite self-explanatory here. The first 10 minutes in, a, say, a six-month-old kid, you'd run 15, then 10 and 5. In even smaller kids, 25, 20, and 50. So it's quite, uh, and these are all available freely if you want to have a look at it. We'll, uh, last few slides, uh, remifentanil, which is the new kid on the block. Why is there so much excitement about it? Because it's, you know, at the beginning, again, we were talking about what an ideal anesthetic for Tiva should be. Remy ticks most of those boxes. It's an ultra short acting drug. It's a powerful drug. It's a mu agonist. So potency wise, it's almost exactly the same as fentanyl you can think of. So a mic per kilo of fentanyl and a mic per kilo of Remy is not very different to each other. And uh, it's metabol a smart thing is that it is metabolized by tissue esterases and plasma esterases. So regardless of how many hours or even days you run off uh, uh, remifentanil, the system never gets saturated. It is out of the system within the next four to six minutes. It is safe. It is independent of the kidney function. It's independent of liver dysfunction. So it's a great drug to use uh, in even in CKD patients and those with slightly dodgy livers. So this is why there is so much uh, excitement about remifentanil. It's an excellent uh, uh, drug to, if you, those who will start using Remy, and some of you I think have already started, you'll notice that your anesthetic uh, BP will look almost rock steady, regardless of how much stimulation the surgeon is giving, if you know how to use your remifentanil right. And it has up to a 30% sparing effect of morphine. But it has its common side effects too, which are all essentially vagotonic. So it can produce bradycardia. So if you're using other vagotonic drugs like propofol, like, de like dexmeditomidin, we need to be careful, especially in beta block patients. It can cause hypotension as well because it's a potent opioid. So it needs to be used carefully. So practically, how do I use remifentanil? So always, always uh, remifentanil, first thing to know is it is not designed as a bolus drug. It comes in a powder form of either 1mg or 2mg in the Indian market. And the best thing to do is to dilute it across the hospital. Everyone should dilute it to the same 
uh, concentration so that there's no confusion. So if you're using one mg, dilute it in 20 ml of either saline or uh, dextrose. If it is two mg, do it in 40 ml, which basically gives 50 mics per ml. And please make sure this becomes standard practice. It is not a drug to be given as a bolus. If you have a TCI pump, you could start with the L-level regimen for that. So the way to start with, after keying in the patient identifying data, would be to start with nano. So remember, this is very potent drug. So where we were talking about micrograms in propofol, we are talking nanograms. So it's thousandfold more powerful in terms of the effect. So it's one nanogram per ml. Pre-oxygenate the child and slowly crank it up to somewhere between three and four nanograms per mil. If you don't have a TCI pump again, a manual regimen can be used. And in fact, this is what we were using even in the UK for the under 30 kilos, because back then Minto regimen was for 30 and above. So the way to do it is simple. Again, the weight of the kid, so you do your normal dilution of 50 mics per mil and keep it there. The weight of the kid in kilos into 0.12 will give you what is 0.1 mic per kilo per minute for that kid. So a 10 kilo kid, say 10 into 0 0.12 is 1.2 ml. For that kid, it would be 1.2 ml an hour would be the same as giving 0.1 mic per kilo per minute. So the way to run it is start at 1.2 ml an hour, give it a uh, start pre-oxygenating, slowly go up to 0.2, which would be 2.4 ml an hour, and then finally to 3.6 <laughs> So that's the smart way of doing it. Again, we have started it well, but like, uh, you know, this is the takeoff at the landing point. Remember that Remy beauty is that it gets out of the system. What it also means, it's analgesic effect is gone virtually straight after you switch off within five minutes. So make sure you plan your post-operative analgesia well before stopping the Remy fentanyl. I mean, most people use a longer acting opioid. Some, If you're using your blocks, that's fine. If you're using multimodal analgesia, that's fine. But make sure that analgesic is working as we are switching off the Remy because the Remy is out of the system in no time. So Gillian Lauder is one of the thought leaders in uh, pediatric anesthesia and her feeling is that TIVA will eventually supersede inhalational anesthesia even in pediatric anesthetic practice, let alone oh. adult practice. So this is something that is the future is now, as they say. So I think it behoves all of us to learn this technique and start using it in a sensible, guided way. Work with people who have used it before and slowly build up your practice and confidence. So I'll conclude by saying kindly do consider using TIVA in children. We are by no means evangelical about it. We know that you are expert anesthetists, you have your choices, you have your preferences, but please consider adding TCI TIVA to your uh, armamentarium. Propofol alone is not going to be enough in terms of surgical conditions. So please combine it with good uh, analgesia like remifentanil if you can get it or any other good analgesia that you want to do it. Real world means that you all kids who come to us may not have a cannula. So an inhalational induction is not a contraindication to TIVA. Like I say, it's not a either or. Using the best of both is smart. So, but the thing to be to remember is start, if you've had to induce by gas induction, and then you have to slowly build up your TIVA, make sure that you're, uh, you know, you build it up very slowly so that the pharmacodynamic hit, combined pharmacodynamic hit of both the inhalational and the intravenous do not happen at the same time. Processed EEG uh, monitoring is a useful adjunct and wherever possible beyond the age of one year, the AIGBI recommendations are that we should be using some form of processed uh, EEG in these kids. At the end of the day, it is just a pump. It doesn't know the patient. It doesn't see the patient. It just, uh, just uh, does what you ask it to. So please do not uh, uh, give up. Uh, we should not give up our clinical judgment and solely rely on the pump. It's only a pump, but when used well, I think we will all get excellent uh, results from it. Thanks a lot for your patient hearing. Back to you, Dr. Savan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shishi, Dr. Kusharzar, and Dr. Kalpana. Excellent and very informative lectures. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can go. Uh, there is one um, in a chat box. Uh, uh, it was asked that is there any new guideline for using dexmedinotomidine in the pediatric population? Yeah. So, who wants to take uh, any call? Dr. Kushar or Dr. Shishir? Any one of you? Dr. Shishir, uh, yeah, uh, your thoughts. I, I myself have, I'm not a user of uh, dexmedetomidine as part of uh, TIVA practice, but I know that uh, newer regimens have come and uh, it is getting uh, more and more popular, but I wouldn't like to comment because I don't use it myself. 
Subhu, if you have uh, any experience, please go ahead. No, no, uh, I personally don't have uh, in kids as TCI. I have used it as other modes, but as TCI, I have not had. Dr. Vivek, do you want to join in? Uh, uh, hello, sir. Unfortunately, I am uh, not in a state to turn on the video <laughs> time at home. Uh -huh. So uh, there are quite a few models for uh, dexmeditomidine also. Uh, there is one model called Dykes model, which <laughs> we can use as, uh, as adjunctive uh, uh, analgesic uh, uh, administration. And then there is one called Morse model, which apparently is a uh, universal model. It is the elevated counterpart for dexmeditomidine. Uh, I don't have personal experience in using, but I have read papers where people are happy about using the Morse model as a, a sole uh, a sedative agent for dexmeditomidine. Uh, in future, if we get a chance, probably we will use it and then probably we'll be able to demonstrate also how uh, it works and whether we were happy or not. Okay. Uh... I think, uh, Dr. Vivek, uh, you had given recently one very nice lectures about the neuromonitoring and actually uh, I heard it and it was quite excellent. So, in fact, we were quite worried about, usually we are worried about all these neuro patients, especially those who are undergoing the neurosurgery. And we do yes, uh, quite a lot of neurosurgical patients, not only neurosurgical, but which are, which are where IONM is used for the scoliosis or even the airway surgeries are used. We do use a total intravenous uh, anesthesia very frequently and very extensively. Uh, TCI yet to use, but uh, I think uh, we are always worried about those. Uh, you explained it very beautifully about those alpha, beta, and the theta waves. Okay. So, Madam, if I may just I think, uh, add, uh, if, if one thing I might add is the advantage of once remifentanil comes into use is what is happening is we are often having to titrate our propofol up and down a lot as of now. Correct in these Correct. situations, but it is not really a depth problem, even in scoliosis, it's a pain problem. And so yes. it, uh, once remifentanil comes, it is much easier to titrate the remi from four to six to even eight nanograms per ml and bring it back after the stimulus is gone. So that way our wake ups also will be better and the anesthetics tend to be much smoother. So it's just a matter of uh, waiting for that remifentanil for things like scoliosis surgeries where certain bits of it are exquisitely painful. But you can still yes. keep propofol at the same 3 or 2.5 and then go up and down on the remi as necessary. So, uh, Dr. Okay. So, then you yes. just want to ask one question. So, uh, Dr. Shishe, so would you like to use a remi in the remi and propofol? Uh, would you like to use again BIS or some other monitoring system you require for neuromonitoring? No, for, for the depth of anesthesia, I'm talking about yeah, both uh, the, the BIS or entropy, both of them work uh, quite well, madam. And again, I think the big fear is when we are actually not uh, uh, when we are giving real, too much of relaxants, when we don't give relaxants unnecessarily, that itself confers a degree of safety. But even when we do use BIS or entropy, the alpha on delta, which I think Vivek beautifully explained the other day also, is what we are really looking for to titrate depth rather than just the number alone. Yes, yes. Dr. Shishet, uh, uh, if have, no, have, uh, Dr. Shishet, yes. now we, let's say if we are using both Remy and Propofol, just to uh, uh, understand, so we would look for to have a steady state of Propofol uh, before the actual surgery wants, um, starts and then titrate the uh, levels of uh, Remy fentanyl as and when we see it is going up or down. Is that right? Did I get it right? Absolutely right. Absolutely. Because once surgery starts, there is no real reason for the depth of anesthesia to change. What is changing is the pain stimulus. And for that, what we need is analgesia to change rather than amnesia. The amnesia is more or less assured from uh, from the beginning. Maybe a small yes. change in the profile, but uh, keep altering the... Small change. Uh, yes. Small change may be necessary. Yes. 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 Uh, I do have a lot of questions, but I think I can ask you personally, I think, uh, later on. Uh, just uh, pleasant to know that you have heard my lectures and I hope they were useful. <laughs> okay. Really, uh, so I think uh, one only one question uh, to Dr. Uh, uh, Tushar. Uh, you said about the dex, dex, dexa you use as an infusion. So for which cases do you use, Dr. Tushar? Uh, okay, madam. I am using in the surgery more than one hour. So in ENT, pediatric mastoidectomy and uh, some major surgery in urology. So probably dexmedicine, but now I have switched over to propofol only. 
ओके सो डेक्समेड ओके एंड मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट या यू यूज अ मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट डू यू यूज इन पीडियाट्रिक पेशेंट्स ऑल ईएनटी पेशेंट्स टॉन्सिलेक्टोमी देन मेस्टरडेक्टोमी एवरीथिंग मैं सी ऑल माय रेज्यूमे इन एक्सोना मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट एंड ऑल जाइलोकार्स आर गिवन टू ऑल सेट ऑफ द पेशेंट मोर देन 2 इयर्स इवन एस्मोलोल आई एम यूजिंग मोर देन 2 इयर्स ऑल पेशेंट्स सपोज इफ देयर इज अ सी इन पीडियाट्रिक ईएनटी प्रैक्टिस देयर आर सो मेनी हाइपर like uh, tachycardia blood pressure is increasing in tonsillectomy after uh, tiva practice so at that time i use little bit of esmolol according to weight so it comes down beautifully down and patients are happy surgeons are happy i'm exclusively doing tiva practice uh, ent tiva practice with this drugs not what tci yeah. tiva yeah actually yes in a private practice people do say that you know we don't have pump and we don't have uh, you know but i think uh, you are be the role model uh, other than this kataria post- and the uh, purifier yeah. dr tushar <laughs> chokse is the role model that, for uh, all the first question i was there but uh, somebody asked about the dex mandatory guidelines so i want i want to say that in gi uh, gi uh, this procedures like colonoscopy then endoscopy i use dex cat that is 1 microgram plus 1 milligram per uh, kilogram body weight and it works excellent even in tonsillectomy yeah. once i give 1 milligram 1 microgram according to ba- uh, weight base then i do not have to repeat anything at least my surgeons are comfortable for, for at least 15 minutes of tonsillectomy procedure and uh, at that time i have to repeat only one or two dose of the scolin and the my procedure every day i am doing two three tonsillectomy since last 25 years so okay. i have switched over from ketofol to dex uh, dexcat in this type of the patients yeah actually yes this is a tiva uh, is itself this method is excellent actually whether it is a pediatric or whether it is a geriatric and as i said itself is a very good technique people have been using it but it is now it is more refined way of using with the yeah, tiva and the tci okay uh, we have like a question go green okay without any uh, theater pollution and with a much of advantages probably you know ma'am so, we have a question in the chat uh, we, uh, shall we ask this for uh, uh, dr kalpana kalpana should the iv line be exclusively used for tiva only or we can use with fluid infusion no i think the iv line what you are using for tiva tci should be exclusively used for tiva tci you may have you may piggyback a line with fluid infusion if you want to but otherwise it has to be an exclusive line which is visible at all the times and avoid an anticoagulant line wonderful ma'am yeah. ma'am uh, next part of the uh, shall we go ahead to the next one next part which is an exciting part yes yes okay. kalpana are you ready yeah just a minute ma'am. madam i'll just uh, share my screen ma'am uh, uh, as she gets the things ready no it is coming from the land of uh, uh, you know bollywood where uh, the picture abhi baki hai is a popular slogan <laughs> Uh, the the so, last yes. part of the picture is uh, exciting uh, dr kalpana yes. is saying which are using it online we have used it in smaller platforms and uh, we are all excited to see how it works it's a quiz for everyone uh, please uh, uh, kalpana you can follow with instructions and we are all excited to see this new format of learning being introduced thank you so can i request all of you to open your smartphones and uh, please uh, type type in www.kahoot.it they will ask you for a game pin and put in the number that is 4463415 what you are seeing flashing on your screen is my screen visible yes so once you yes, put that, yeah once you put that number please join in with uh, your name yeah so sir amit has joined so people can just join in we have just created a very basic quiz for our, uh, for people today and uh, let's hope how we get i think my quiz allows 50 people to join in i see 40 participants here i really don't know if participants from the anesthesia tv and the other uh, youtube tv are joining us so that's great people are joining in and we'll have to give uh, madam 5 to 10 minutes for people to join in <clears throat> sure can even just scan the code also that will straight away join you yes that has to be dr amit yes dr kalpana good yes. evening excellent lecture the most Thank most you. Pro- most proficient in all this uh, it stuff i can say <laughs> 
Yeah, all three lectures were excellent. Absolutely, um, you know, uh, crisp and a uh, lot of information in the you know, limited time. Actually, this is a one day of a course can be done. But I think uh, we need to be, you know, more concentrated yeah. in one for two hours. Madam, I would advise you, you keep a workshop in the Wadia Children Hospital for one day. Yeah, sure, yeah. sir. Actually, definitely, yes. From IOTA. Definitely. To, uh, IOTA from, uh, see, actually, what has happened, actually, I didn't receive any TCI pump. You know the public you hospitals don't worry about uh, usually. Don't worry about TCI pump. We will bring No, our... but I'm worried about the fentanyl. It, it has to get, you have to give me some fentanyl as well. So, we can keep some. Uh, definitely. Fentanyl in using fentanyl. Yeah. Ready madam, fentanyl, I'm I, Yeah, madam, if you apply for any fentanyl. I do have. You have it. Then, madam, the company yes. should you, give you a free pump with it, madam. Yes. Yes, I'm just waiting for my friend. Okay. Remy, rather. Okay. This is the first time we are doing this type of the question answer kahoot in any platform since last 10 years in webinar history of india <laughs> this is actually i must congratulate you this is your second webinar first i had attended it was a quite good we are this doing is the second this. webinar of iota we are doing this uh, every part of the our workshop now to survey this is same as what we do it in gark yes yes i know that <laughs> we know that amit Amit is uh, from Baroda Anesthesiologists and he has started a TCIT recently since last two months and he is very happy. Around 30 people have joined. Yes. Madam, can we wait for another three, four minutes before we start? Yes, sure. Just in meantime, just wanted to know uh, the starting concentration. Of course, not I am not used it for the pediatric patients, but for adult patient also. Is it three microgram or uh, you start with more or less? Sir, it's uh, Shishir here. I'll take that question if that's okay. So uh, I think the best option, especially when we are learning uh, uh, the technique new, is to start from one. So that's what I uh, do it and I tell my PGs also to do. We start typically effect site at one. So uh, allow it to actually reach about 0.8 to 0.9, then go up to two and then uh, allow it to come to 1.6, 1.7, and then go up to three. So somewhere between two and three is when we have loss of uh, verbal response. This is for propofol in mics per ml. If we are using both propofol and remifentanil, better to start remifentanil first, something in the order of one nanogram per ml, start pre-oxygenating because we know it's a powerful uh, respiratory depressant and causes bradypneas and then slowly build it up to somewhere between two to three nanograms per ml and then start the propofol. So that way it has a good propofol uh, sparing effect also. So titration and incremental dosing is better than uh, starting stay straight at three. Because what happens is when we set the effect site at three, the plasma typically goes about three to four times as much. Like I was explaining the anesthetic overpressure, something like nine to 10 mics per ml, and then it dips down. So that causes more of a pharmacodynamic hit. Whereas if you build it up slowly, we don't see that hit. I have an entropy. So basically I look at the entropy values and sure. then, you know, uh, decide about my next like intubation or something. Since we're using relaxant with that, Sure. So right now I'm building up right to three and it gives 13, 14, 15 ml of propofol, then waits for three minutes or something, two, three minutes, and then again it starts back. So what are you using, Eleveld or Schneider? I, I'm using Eleveld. Yeah, with Eleveld, the V1 is about twice as much as uh, Schneider. So you may occasionally see the, I mean, this is for other people who don't use it regularly. If you're using Schneider, even to start at three might be okay. But for Eleveld to start straight at three might be a big dose because it calculates its V1 in a 70 kilo patient to be about nine liters as opposed to 4.7 liters in uh, Schneider. So our suggestion is it's better to go up slowly by increments of one if possible. Thank so you. coming in my cardiac patients with a low ejection fraction, I start off as low as 0.8 and 1 and then I kind of titrate it up. 
No, but then when do you intubate? Basically, uh, when you will intubate, one, two, three, whatever concentration you set, when do you intubate? Because with ROC, we know that the with ROC uranium patient are going to become relaxed very fast. And uh, then when do you intubate? Uh, at what level? If you don't have a, a depth of anesthesia monitor, with depth of anesthesia, things are relatively simpler. But without that, when do you intubate? No, I, I mean, of course, I do use BIS. I don't have... Uh... Uh, entropy or anything so i use bis as of now and once my verbal response has gone then i know that and i can ventilate my patient that is the time when i give a relaxant and then i intubate my patient so dr amit what i try to do when i don't have access to bis for all patients again i use bis where possible and entropy but where i don't where the loss of verbal response has been i try to keep it at least 25 percent again there's no uh, scientific thing to say but 25 to 30 percent above that for my intubation and be guided by clinical signs and then come back to no lower than 25% more than where I lost verbal response. Uh, uh, Dr. Shishan, I'll pitch in briefly here. Yeah. What I also find sometimes is, you know, the jaw thrust maneuver is perhaps one of the most painful stimulus. And uh, I also see at what level they lose that response after loss of verbal contact. And that is the level around which I usually maintain. And that is a level probably is appropriate for intubation as well. Point. So we have uh, just five minutes left. So uh, if it's all okay, I'm just going to start the quiz now with the permission of yes. uh, Dr. Savant and Dr. Subramaniam. May yes, I yes, yes. I think more than 30 people are there. Yeah. Okay. So you have to choose the correct answer in 30 seconds. Total intravenous anesthesia is the use of intravenous agents with volatile, intravenous agents with nitrous oxide, only intravenous drugs or volatile agents with muscle relaxant. Please choose one of the right answers. Dr. Kalpana, you are always giving chocolates. How do you <laughs> give chocolates now? This is a... Yes, she will send the chocolates who are the winners. You know. We'll keep account, madam. We'll keep account. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so eight people have answered it correctly that it is only intravenous drugs. Who's SUB? He's kind of scoring the highest right now. Whoever... I hope it's not Subramaniam. <laughs> uh, that was me, actually. Specific you know, indication. We are not supposed to participate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not supposed to participate. Specific okay. indications for total intravenous uh, anesthesia include all, except you have to choose, except the answer uh, long QP syndrome, nora, malignant hypothermia, PONV, porphyria, or morbid obesity, which is a specific indication for TIVA. So three people have answered morbid obesity. And let's see who's the answered correctly. Oh, Vivek, is that our Vivek? Please don't. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you will get your well, chocolates. I meet you next time, but please don't be there. High <laughs> level match fixing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you to pharmacokinetics. The term effect site refers to what? When you're using the term effect site in pharmacokinetics, what does it say? Is it an area in the body in which the drug exerts the desired biological effect? Is it the receptors on cells having effect on organ of interest? Is it an organ in the body where the drug is most effective or is it the site of highest drug concentration? When you say effect site, what do you mean? Great. So quite a few people have answered an area in the body in which the drug exerts the desired biological effect, which is the brain. So again, let's see. Dr. Amit is heading with 1481. So the next question is, is it important for anesthetists to have an in-depth knowledge of the pharmacokinetic models to safely deliver TCI? The answer can be yes. The depth of uh, understanding is required or no knowledge of PK models are required or it is important to have some knowledge. And the next is what's there to learn. 
Okay, so yes, in depth of understanding is required, and I'm so glad all of them are. Students. Again, here I think Dr. Amit is going to take the cake today. <laughs> Which of the following statements are correct? You need to take the correct statement. Propofol has a shorter context as okay. a half time than remifentanil. Propofol and remifentanil can be mixed together. Propofol has a longer time to peak effect compared to thiopentone. And effect site targeting induction is quicker than plasma site targeting. So effect site targeting induction is quicker than plasma site and eight of you all have answered this correctly. Okay. Moving on to the next question. In comparison with Marsh pharmacokinetic model for propofol, the Schneider model has faster propofol onset, has better wake-up profile, is more suitable for elderly patients, or does it overestimate the propofol effect site concentration? So we discussed the Marsh and the Schneider model. Marsh only takes the weight into consideration, doesn't take the age, whether Schneider takes height, weight, age, and the lean body mass. So does it have a faster propofol onset, better wake-up profile, more suitable in elderly, or overestimates the propofol effect site concentration? Okay, is more suitable for elderly patients and four of them have answered it correctly. Bhavya has answered it correctly. What are some of the benefits of titrating up the TCI propofol level during induction? Select the correct answer. So, benefits of titrating the TCI propofol during induction, a more gentle induction is possible. We don't need to give any opioids with titration. Patient will lose consciousness quickly or we will know how sensitive our patient is to anesthesia. So which of the four is the correct answer? Correct. Titrate, titrate, titrate. That should be your mantra. And you can have a gentle induction while you are doing that. When used in pharmacokinetic term, the term compartment best refers to what? Is this an anatomically defined space which the drug appears to occupy after injection? Is it a physiologically defined space which the drug appears to occur after injection? Or is it a mathematically concept of a space that drug appears to occupy after injection? Or is it a space in the body where a drug goes to be, goes to be metabolized? So we just did... Uh, this model, which is pharmacokinetic model, three compartment model, bolus elimination transfer technique. So can you just tell me in this, what is this? Is it anatomically, is this an actual space? Is it a mathematical space or is it a physiological space? Or is it just a space in the body where the drug goes to be metabolized? Give it a little longer time for this question. Okay, actually, it's a mathematical concept of a space that the drug appears to occupy after the injection. And uh, let us see who has answered it correctly. Wow. Havya, 4808. On fire. So, what is context sensitive half time? Is it a time for the drug to be sensitive? Is it a time taken for the action of the drug to decline by one half? Time for effect site action to decline by half? And time for the plasma concentration of the drug to decline by half once the infusion is stopped? Context sensitivity half time is what? So it is a time for the plasma concentration of the uh, drug to decline by half once the infusion has been stopped. 
And when we look at the scoreboard, uh, Bhavya is heading at 5493. Dhaya is at the, uh, following her. Dr. Amit, please buck up. What is 1086 rule of propofol infusion? Is it the minutes of propofol infusion at the rate of 1 milligram per kg? It is the TCI rate for propofol infusion in decreasing order. Is it manual infusion or distal regimen? Or is it a different, a different infusion rates to infuse propofol? So what is the manual infusion regime? 1086 that we had just discussed. What is it called? It is a manual infusion or it is called as a Bristol regimen. And uh, wow, Bhavya, you are at 6272. Dhaya is at 4938. Dr. Amit is at double four double seven. Two widely available and validated pediatric models for plasma target are is it a holiday cigar regimen? Is it the Kataria model from age of 3 to 16 years? Is it pet fuser model for 1 to 16 years? Or is it the Stua regimen? So which are the validated pediatric models for plasma targeting? Pataria and Petfuser. There are two answers. And uh, 13 of them have said Kataria and only seven had said Petfuser. Okay, we have the same people, but I think there is a good competition between three of them. Yeah, Kwan Banega Kahoot Pati. Madam, are we giving, sending them some gifts? No, no, yeah, definitely, yes. <laughs> With regards to awareness in patients undergoing TIVA, which of the following is false? Please answer the false answer, okay? Higher incidence of awareness in TIVA technique. NAPFI recommends the use of processed EG, gaps in induction or switching to volatile agents, technical errors or poor application of pharmacokinetics. This monitoring helps limit the excess hypnosis in patients undergoing Piva and process EG is not mandatory in all cases. I want you to give me the false answer. When you are looking for awareness or want to when to decrease the incidence of awareness in patients who are undergoing Piva, which is the wrong answer in this? Okay, process EG is not mandatory in all cases is the wrong answer. We said that the NAP5 protocol did say that we must, when you're using TRTCI, it must be guided by some form of depth of anesthesia monitoring. Most of these monitorings do have processed or raw EGs. So that is what is mandatory. <clears throat> Again, a strong competition. Three of them have put up their places very well. Now let us see who's going to make the final run. Pharmacokinetics of propofol. Choose one of it. Propofol follows the three compartment model after a bolus dose. PCI pumps can predict the time for patient to wake up after stopping the infusion. Steady state of propofol concentration can be achieved without using a bolus dose. And manual boluses achieve steady state. You have to just choose one answer, which is the most correct. Propofol follows three compartment model after a bolus dose. Okay, Anish has climbed up and he's now coming up. So let's see. Remifentanil, when used in TCI, is ideal for prolonged infusion due to its context sensitive half time. PK is not altered by the patient age, does not offer post operative analgesia and can be used as a sole anesthetic agent for surgical procedures. So when you're using remipentanil in target control infusion, which of this is correct?
So it's ideal for prolonged infusion due to its context sensitivity half time, which is around less than five minutes. So once you stop, the patient is going to be awake. The shorter the context sensitivity half time, the faster you can use that drug and get the patient out. So again, now AL, whoever is AL has beaten Anish and Amit also, Dr. Amit also. We have last two questions to score. The infusion algorithm for TCI is based on which model? Which is this model? Is this a BAT bat model? Is it a BIT model? Is it a BET model? Or is, it, is this showing us a context sensitive half time? It's the BET, Bolus Elimination Transfer Technique. And, uh, oh, Bhavya, Dhaya, and now Anish has coming up. The last two questions. Depth of anesthesia monitors are all except BIS, Narcotren, Patient State Index, Entropy, TG, Cerebral State Monitor. So please point out which one of this is not a depth of anesthesia monitor. So depth of anesthesia monitor are all except. Okay, so TEG, thromboelastogram, is not a depth of anesthesia monitor. Now we move on to the last question. Is it going to be a tiebreaker? Bhavya is at 7983, Dhaya is at 7390, Anish is at 7131. Okay. As a safety checklist for TIVA TCI, one should include the following, except we by underwent a safety checklist. One should include the following except plug in all the pumps to the mains, right drug, right algorithm and the patient details, flush all the lines at the end of case, secure correct lines and connections, program the pumps after inserting the label syringe and this is not mandatory. So this is not mandatory is not correct. This is supposed to be there for every, I, rather than saying this, I would say any depth of anesthesia monitoring should be there. So here is your podium for, so Anish has Anish. stood third wow. at 7907. Dhaya has stood second at 8058. And Bhavya has stood first. Wow. Bhavya, congrats. wow. congratulations. At 8682. And, uh, Congratulations, Daya and Anish as well. Yes. Congratulations uh, to all the winners. And I thank you very much, Madam, for allowing me to uh, put up this Kahoot uh, uh, quiz on this on your platform. No, it was enjoyable, Kalpana. It was very nicely conducted. It was really enjoyable. Thank you, Madam. Dr. Kalpana, should we put this on the IOTA website? First, IOTA online quiz winners. Yes, we, can, we should put that. <laughs> yes, yes. Dr. Bhavya Patel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Bhavya, Dr. Bhavya, you... from where are you? Bhavya, please unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, teachers. From where are you, Bhavya? I am from Varanasi, ma'am. Wow. No, Congratulations, she... Bhavya. Thank madam, you. Thank she's you. a student with us, madam. Yes, ma'am, from Breach Candy. She's our student, oh. madam. Ah. <laughs> oh. Okay, and uh, Dhaya, where's Dhaya? Bhavya, Good evening, ma'am. Yeah. Hello? I can't see Dhaya. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, uh, this is Daya from Rim Simphal, Manipur. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. From Congratulations, Daya. From Manipur, yes. Excellent. Very nice. And Anish, Thank can you tell us? Is, is this our Anish again? Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, hi, Anish. How are you? Hi, good, ma'am. 
as student from Beach Candy again. <laughs> Congratulations, Bhavya and Anish. Thanks, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, wow. Oh, madam is there. Dr. Sneha Dada, thank you. Wow. Yes. Yeah. All the Our speakers were excellent. Yeah. yeah. It was very nice. Yeah. Uh, madam, would you like to go ahead with the rest of the proceedings, please? Uh, yes, I think uh, is everything over, and uh, I personally thank uh, everyone. Uh, you know, to Dr. Tushar, Dr. Shishir. Uh, and you especially, you know, for uh, formulating and, uh, you know, conducting this uh, second IOTAS webinar. Uh, it was quite excellent. And uh, to the point, actually, in fact, I had talked to Dr. Tushar Sokshi that we should have an uh, um, workshop on this. Uh, but because of the time constraint, I think uh, we just uh, decided to go for a, you know, webinar. But Dr. <laughs> அதுக்கப்புறம் <laughs> 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 Okay, so I uh, thank everyone again. Again, Hello. I am thanking you for, for such a nice and excellent, you know, baby. We all enjoyed it, you know, talking about all pharmacokinetics and the details about, you know, which drug to use, uh, which, um, uh, you know, pumps to use and how to use them. I think it requires a workshop, but I promise Dr. Tushar, uh, me and Kalpana will formulate, you know, when to do this workshop and definitely we will do it in the Mumbai and we invite all of you, you know, for this workshop. Thank you. Sure, sure. Because it is uh, really wonderful to learn from you people. Uh, and uh, thank you. And I uh, give a best wishes to your avatar. Do all good works. And uh, definitely it is going to go up and up. Best wishes from me. Thank you very much. And thank you all the delegates, you know, attending this work, you know, webinar on this Sunday evening. Otherwise, it's the time to go out. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, thank you. thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kalpana. Thanks, Tushar and Dr. Thanks, Dr. Shishir. Thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for the opportunity. You just thanks to everyone. For uh, starting this partnership. Thank you. And... Uh, Thanks to all the speakers. We are, they are our uh, our own. Uh, so thanks and sorry. Uh, I, I don't, it's all understood. So we are very 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 happy uh, the way it was it has gone. Slides was excellent. Uh, I mean I can't yes. choose which slides were better. Uh, all three seem to be competing against each other for the quality of slides. So what do you say, ma'am? Slide. Yes, it's absolutely so crisp. So you know, absolute crisp information. No, no, absolutely over uh, you know timings. Quite good. Very nice. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank, thank you, all of you. Tushar, bye. Uh, and uh, Shishir, thank yeah. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thanks, Kalpana. Bye. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye, bye, bye. You know, have a nice rest of the day.